Welcome to Drivers Talk Radio, hosted by automotive expert and championship winning race car driver Rick Titus. Join Rick, co host Jay Dalton, and their team for informative and entertaining discussions geared for automotive enthusiasts and consumers alike. Enjoy in depth interviews with industry leaders and influencers. Now, originating from its studio headquarters inside Shelby American in Las Vegas, it's time for Drivers Talk Radio and Rick Titus. And welcome to Drivers Talk Radio. I'm Rick Titus, and we truly appreciate you being here. Having said that, joining me in studio, of course, is Jay Dalton, of course, the producer and co-host of the program. How you been, bud? I've been just great. Thank you, Rick. A lot of good things going on? Oh, we we have an abundance of news. This is one of the news. biggest shows we've had yeah, so far. Yeah, this will be a full one. And, of course, over there making us look taller than we actually are if you're watching us on your computer. And that, of course, is Spencer Crick. How you been? Uh, good, good. I'm working with these audio stilts to try to enhance how tall we look, and <laughs> I, it's working pretty well, I think. And we're going to be officially in HD here pretty quick, right? Yeah, I got one more test to run, and then we're there. Um, cool. Uh, did you cue the airplane? Uh, you know, we are we're coming to you right, very, very close to the Las Vegas airport, the McCarran Field, uh, of course, coming to you from Las Vegas at Shelby American. We sit amidst their museum. The tours here are free. We'd love for you to come on by. Of course, you get to, well, you know, you have to see Cobras and 4GTs and GT350s and all kinds of Mustangs, Shelby Mustangs and whatnot. And they make you go out in the shop and watch you build them. And, and you see the Cobras being assembled. And, of course, this is a great gift shop. It's just a terrible thing for free, huh? You might be forced to learn the entire history yeah, of Shelby American. Shelby American. Against your will. That's right. <laughs> and, and even that's free. So not bad stuff there. And, of course, uh, this program is brought to you by Kicker High Performance Audio, where they simply say, raise your expectations. Uh, we certainly got a close demo of that. If you're in Las Vegas, we'd love to have you go on Sunday mornings, 9.20 a.m. at 8 o'clock on Sunday mornings. Uh, Lotus Broadcasting, of course, an ESPN Sports Talk program called The Game. We are on just before all the big stick and ball games. Uh, it's an honor position. We appreciate it very much, and that's just one of our AM FM stations. For those stations around the country, all of whom's call letters we don't know, we apologize, but uh, these cats are in our backyard, so we're pretty good to them. A little later in the program, of course, we have our book club giveaway sponsored by Motorbooks. Uh, today we've got a kind of an interesting book because speeds become very important in May. So. Yes, yes, the month of speed. <laughs> yep. Exactly right, Rick. So, a lot going on. You want to talk about some news? Yes. Hey, man, uh, it was you who who kept pounding into me that that having a competitor raises your game. Oh, absolutely. Uh, if you don't have a competitor, you might get a little bit soft. Mm. Well, here as we sit amongst the Fords <laughs> <laughs> this last weekend. Uh, the the new competitor came out, the brand new Generation Six Camaro. I know where you're going. Do yep. you did you uh, follow this at all? I have seen a little bit of it, and I have a sh- shocking revelation that I might not have caught until it was pointed out to me. But okay, all right. They it was revealed at Belle Isle, although there was quite a clamor because CNBC apparently flashed some pictures of it on Friday ahead of this grand fiesta that they were having at Belle Isle. All of which uh, you know are never cheap. Oh, my gosh. And I'm thinking, who's the PR guy that got the pictures out uh-huh. by mistake on CNBC instead of the, the magic of the reveal Deal. at Belle Isle in front of, oh, a couple of thousand Camaro enthusiasts who'd driven their Camaros down and everything? <laughs> like, what are you doing? What happened Blowing here? Blowing it man. at the last minute. Anyway, just a quick review of Camaro. They stopped Camaro in 2002. We interviewed Scott Settlemeyer on the last final you know, days. Do you remember that? The marketing the, manager. You pointed out. And yeah. all the reasons why Camaro was killed in 2002. It was the end of Camaro. And then, of course... Well, that was delicately put. It was delicately put. Never, Nevertheless, we also had the, the thrill of reintroducing Camaro when the CEO of General Motors at the time, so Rick I guess, Wagner... I guess reborn would be the re, term. <laughs> the rebirth. <laughs> Said anyway, you killed it off. Yes. Now it's reborn. So Rick Wagner um, slipped it into an interview we had with him that, oh, by the way, the new Camaro is going to come out and so forth. So here we are on Gen 6 based on the Cadillac ATS platform. What do you know about this thing? Well, what got pointed out to me this morning on Facebook was, quite frankly, when you see the new Mustang and the new Camaro next to each other, wow, they are very, very close. Very similar in shape and size? Very similar, yeah. The profiles are nearly on identical. 
including the indentation on the side, the sculpting on the side of the car, the way the snouts are faced, even the, the Camaro has a slightly higher buttress rear end. Uh, than the Mustang, which actually worked at lowering it by two inches, mm. uh, but pretty interesting. Uh, this is, uh, it's a delicate dance between honoring the past and carefully tiptoeing into the future. Nope, and, you're right. And making all the allowances that you have to have to meet the safety standards, rollover standards, impact standards, not to mention emissions. Right. And, and uh, fuel economy. Fuel economy and so forth. With that in mind, you know, this is going to come, I've been told, it's coming with six different powertrains. That's a, a misstatement. Yeah. What right. happens is it's three engines and a couple of different transmissions, a six speed and an eight speed. So you can get a six or an eight behind those right. three engines. Right. But uh, they will go all the way from a two liter four cylinder, which is turbocharged all the way up to a 6.2 liter LT1 V8. Same horsepower as the Corvette. Mm. Now, you know, the first thing that caught my ear when, it, when I came across this is, I wonder what that's going to do to ATS V sales or CTS V sales, Cadillac oh, yeah. V sales. Remember, Interesting point. I think it was last week, weren't we, or maybe week before, we were talking about $85,000 for a CTS V, mm -hmm. and why would anybody pay that? I mean... Now we're getting the same horsepower in the new Camaro. Okay, it's a Camaro, but can you imagine that price walk is going to be a big gap? It's going to be a big gap, and, it, and I think they may rob customers out of their own potential product line. I think so, too. I think so, too. Just a little bit of architecture. A couple of things I'd like to point out. First of all, Belle Isle is um, just down the road from the Renaissance, the Renaissance Center there in, in downtown Detroit. They are right there on the river front. Uh, they've done a great job in restoring and bringing the, that the whole building back and making that very attractive. Uh, Belle Isle is very, very close down the street from GM's headquarters. In terms of that delicate dance you talked about, Jay, and that's where I thought Mustang did a good job, and I'm hoping Camaro did is equally a good job, and that is keeping key architecture that you recognize but being smart enough to modernize it. And mm -hmm. that, I think that's been a part of that delicate balance. Spencer, you have a thought? Well, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. I would rather design a brand new car than have to update a Mustang or Camaro. You know, that's a completely because you're legitimate under point. So much more pressure. Yep. It, new car every time for me. Yeah. You know, in the design room, up on that board back behind them, is going to be all those iconic design cues. Yo, those are the cues. Where, yeah. where okay, we have, to, we have to hit a little something of this and a little something of this and do it in a modern way. Oh, it's got to be agony. It's got to be well, just agony. Particularly when you look at the fact that they took round taillights off the new Corvette and put Camaro taillights on it, uh, which a lot of people, myself included, still have our noses pretty badly bent out of shape about, because uh, a lot of times you come up on a Corvette and you think you're coming up on a Camaro. Mm -hmm. I don't know that that's flattery necessarily, at least as it applies to the Corvette people. Did you notice they stuck with those same taillights for this new generation? I did not these, get to these see the These are the yet. horizontal style lights. Camaro came back into life in 2010 with a pair of kind of almost round kind of cut off round tail lights uh uh in the back well and then they went to a a more uh, rectangular shape light they've done it again okay we wish them well they've had some luck with the uh with the uh, other design I, somewhere here i've written down how many they sold i think it was 85,000 of the new sorry between 80 and 88,000 of the Generation five, right. so that was a very successful. Oh, it was car it, when they brought it back. In the very, very beginning, it really jumped off the lot. Uh, so it was a good way to come on back, and there were a lot. Of, there was a, a pent up demand for that. Sure, I get a little nervous about the complexity of what they call incremental build when you've got six different powertrain potentials in terms of power. Uh, that's, you know, different trans, different motor. That 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 gets a little involved. Can you imagine uh, they're going to have to certify? Uh, uh, six different powertrains in one car. Yeah, and by certify, I mean you can't just say to the EPA, "Hey, this is good, supposed to be doing this." No, you have to go through the entire EPA procedure when you change the transmission and change Which, the. Which, by the way, is a for-profit division of the United States government working for you. <laughs> yeah. So, having said that, Jay, any release dates? I have not heard when this thing's supposed oh, to come to dealers. Oh, late in the year. Late, yeah, late in the years, so that's the best I've heard as well. You know, Jay, one of the things that's starting to frustrate me is, you know, the media tries to control the world we live in, up to and including uh, so many really predicting the, the, the near death of Cadillac. I think that is grossly oversold. They're only down 1% in total sales, Jay. So I think the 
the rumor of their demise is grossly exaggerated by a media who wants to control virtually everything. And they've still got some very solid hot rods coming. This one in the last week's Auto Week, uh, of course, uh, had Connor Daly, who qualified for the Indy this year, uh, testing both cars. Oddly enough, you'd think, being an Indy car racer and a Formula car racer, he would go for the two-door. He said, in terms of just sheer balance and fun to flow, throw around, uh, the V version ATS, uh, of course, the four-door sedan, mm-hmm. he actually likes slightly better. Mm-hmm. So, And when you think of, you say eighty-five grand, like it's a whole lot of money, but when you look at that segment, that's a good ten to $15,000 out of everything that they compete against under. Mm-hmm. So I, I, I'm not prepared to write Cadillac off. I'm proud of what they've done to bring themselves back. I think they're playing this body style out a little long on the tooth. Probably a little afraid to change it, but there is a whole new plan for Cadillac being cooked up. So let's see what happens. I'm not writing them off yet. I don't buy it. My gauge is, would anybody walk into a tattoo shop and get Cadillac across their forearm? I don't think so. Not yet. You mean, oh, should I get the skull and crossbones or get Cadillac? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Why not both? What, what, was, I, what was I thinking? Hey, yeah. Yes, could I uh, get the Cadillac across it? I have uh, one more quick story. Go this for it. This is out of Venezuela. Did you see where Ford announced that they are only accepting U.S. dollars for their cars sold in Venezuela? The currency control situation in Venezuela at this time is that an oxymoron? Is abs- <laughs> well, there is no control. Right. There is control. There's three official rates, and then the black market rate. The only problem <laughs> is that the that it differs in in value between six uh, six to the dollar compared to 190 to the That's dollar, what I've dollar heard, yeah. for their Bolivar. So, uh, nevertheless, I've never ever heard of a major company laying down the law with the exception maybe in Argentina where the whole country accepted dollars. But I've never heard a major company say to the world, sorry, we're in Venezuela, but we're no longer accepting their currency. Thank you. Technically, converting to uh, dollars is illegal. Uh, Is it really? On the black market. On the black market. And you know if you're buying those cars, you know you've done a black market conversion to get any kind of value so you can step up and buy your Ford. Hey, we come back from break, (laughs) by the way. We've got a very full show for you, not least of which we'll be talking a little bit about Indianapolis. And we've got a very special guest we'll have uh, on the program as well. And uh, we'll introduce you to her. Uh, not long from now. Having said that, we're going to go to break here. We truly appreciate being with us. AMFM listeners, would you come right back after the break? We'd appreciate it. And welcome back to Driver's Talk. Rick Titus, Jay Dalton, and Spencer Crick. We're going to introduce you to our special guest here not long from now. I want to remind you, we do have our book club giveaway sponsored by Motorbooks coming just a little later in the program. I want to also remind you, if you're in Las Vegas and if you don't come and see us here at Shelby American, to get the free tours here of the museum and, of course, their, with the manufacturing plant where they build Shelby Mustangs and Cobras, uh, see the gift shop. We're right just south of Mandalay Bay, just off the Strip. Come on by. Please say hi. The tours are free. A lot of fun stuff. Of course, this program brought to you by Kicker. If you are here and you're either in your own car and or a rented car, please, by all means, on Sunday mornings, tune us in at 8 o'clock on 920 a.m., The Game. That's an ESPN Sports Talk program, and we are privileged to have that spot. That said, you got some news you want to share? Well, I wanted to jump to NASCAR because Spencer brought up a a very interesting uh, thing that happened over the weekend, but you guys are the NASCAR guys. Well, there was an all-star race. Though when I look at the grid, I'm not sure how... Where did it take place? It was kind of right up there with Dancing with the Stars, where you haven't heard about 50 or 70 percent of the people. Uh, that was kind of how that way it was at Charlotte Motor Speedway. Uh, so these it, stars were a little dim, were they? There were some stars there that <laughs> were looking for sponsorship. Let's just go with that. So uh, sponsorless yeah, stars. It's kind of like reignite your career. Oh, yeah, it was the. Oh, I see. Yeah, it was okay. racing so how, with the stars. How yeah. big a field? Uh, would they have better part of 20, 20 racers? Yeah, twenty. Twenty-three cars. Now we're well into the into the season. Why would they? This do is the million-dollar deal. Uh, it just sells tickets for Charlotte, and uh, of course they, uh, you know, it, it was a good turnout. The race in and of itself was fast. I mean, it was plenty of people going quickly. Well, not everybody. Tony Stewart doing what Tony Stewart does, and that was watching the. He, he had Danica six. Let's just go with that. <laughs> like he's been doing all season. So he's season. aiming at twenty-third or twenty-fourth. Yeah, anyway, I, and he fought her hard for it. Um, but I think she wrestled it away from him in the end. 
So are you telling me that some of these people didn't really care about doing this race? There was a little lack of enthusiasm. Well, here's the point. If you're not in the front three or four, you haven't got a shot at a million bucks. But it still paid, what, 150 I believe, Spencer, for second? Um, it went two fifty oh, for 250. second, and yeah. then I believe one hundred or one fifty for third. Yeah, um, and then and well, here's the thing. I go to bed because it was so boring. I went to bed. I was tired. So ten, I see Spencer dollars. in the morning, and I go, Spence, what happened last night? He couldn't stop laughing, <laughs> and I said, I think I might have missed something. Spencer, was, oh, was it man. just a parade? So, <laughs> so I don't know if you know how this race works. For those who don't. Uh, based on how you finish a, each segment, which is 25 laps, that's your pit order. And so through the pit order, pretty much you have to get a good spot or else there's no way you're going to be anywhere near the top three. So Kislowski dominated two of those segments, and he, I believe, was second. And he was speeding out of the pits trying to get in front of a guy, and boom, he's last place now. Send him to the back. Send him to the back. Him and Carl Edwards, though Carl Edwards didn't have a chance at it. Uh, so what, what, what probably would have won it. It's only a million bucks, though. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> for speeding yeah, no. in the pits. That's right. I'd, I'd say he shot himself in the foot, but he blew his foot off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it was kneecap attached to it, right? <laughs> so yeah. the speeding. Yeah. So uh, that's quite a speeding ticket. That's, a, that's <laughs> an ugly one. Now, Jay, you know that I came down fairly harshly on a guy that I used to be a huge fan of, T- Tony Stewart. Not Tony Stewart in real life, because Tony Stewart in real life is kind of a chapped ass. But Tony Stewart is a race driver, very, very talented guy. Mm-hmm. Could drive anything, anywhere, run up front. Kind of the A.J. Foyt of this generation. I would agree uh, completely. Since his crashes, quite frankly, in sprint car. Uh, one which broke his leg up pretty darn good. That took a long time to recover from. And of course, it, that meant he was out of the seat of that car for quite some time in NASCAR. And then, of course, one that took the, the life of a young man in an altercation mm-hmm. uh, at, at a sprint car track. Uh, Tony has since not been good. And I've gotten some hate mail over that, uh, some emails about that. Everyone thought I was being too harsh. But I missed the real Tony Stewart. I really felt that he wasted his time and career on going sprint car racing. Still his passion. He now owns the series. He owns three tracks. Uh, he owns three teams. I mean, the guy loves sprint car racing. Having said all that, even Auto Week had an expose on what happened to Tony Stewart. Oh my God! So yeah, even now it started. People are starting to go. Wait a second, this is too long to recover. Is it in fact over for Tony Stewart at this juncture? Kind of looks like it to me. Interesting, interesting. Um, there was a lot of uh, action in Formula One, which is a new thing. <laughs> Just gonna say, <laughs> really, action? action. By action, I mean publicity. By that, I mean uh, a lot of conversation this last week about how they will begin to change, alter Formula One. This is the open wheel racing conducted around the world, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, road racing entirely, and how the rules might change to make it a better series. This has been going on since 1950, if I'm not mistaken. It's quite quite an old series. But how to make it more spectacular, particularly at the front. First, they've noticed that they're going too slowly, that there are various artificial restraints to slow them down. Mm -hmm. Uh, One is like doing this electric hybrid turbocharger powertrain thing, which they had to do for the car companies. Second one, fuel flow restrictions are completely artificial, Mm -hmm. limited to four engines. If you go to your fifth engine and now you put it at the back of the field and so forth, that's an artificial cost restraint. The lack of testing that they had, you know, they don't test them anymore. That was a NASCAR stunt. Yeah. Test them a couple of times, and a, and various contrived tire rules. Right. They're all going to address this uh, in the coming weeks here to see if they can get the series a little quicker. The quickest lap times that they're recording are now anywhere between two and ten seconds slower than the all-time fastest lap times in 2004. Can you imagine that? That's boy in motor racing. That's not good news. That's not good news. That, now, cons- when, considering how sophisticated these cars are, because there's no refueling in Formula One, because they start out with about 36 gallons of fuel or something, something along that line, the cars are quite slow in the opening laps, and then get faster and faster as they bleed off the the weight, as they use up the weight. So, and they overstress the tires. So they're talking about now refueling. Uh, again, they banned refueling a few years ago, so now they're going to go back to it in 2017. Uh, and they want louder cars. They want cars that rev hires. They want to uh, remove gears from them. Ready? Instead of eight speeds, six speeds, rev them at 15,000 RPM, and also introduce 
an additional exhaust pipe. Now, I guess this pipe would bypass the turbo or something to make some sound again because the cars are too quiet, which completely negates all this hybrid energy capturing business that they set out to do in the first place. Can you believe in RT? No, no. I mean, wow. Anything. I, it, we've watched this in, in, in motor racing across the board. The last eight years, I'm going to say, the more the sanctioning body gearheads at the top believe they know more about motor racing than anyone else frankly few of them actually come from motor racing backgrounds the more mucked up things get and it's only a screwed up let's see nascar indycar <laughs> le mans and of course formula one other than that's going great um what a mess <laughs> well it turns it more and more into a spec series and uh, i thought you were going to say and this would have given spencer a heart attack they decided to go formula e in formula one <laughs> no not not yet they're semi e semi e spence it's don't, a semi, don't get your it's a lower case e not an upper <laughs> case e. in the last couple minutes of this segment let's let's dream just for a second formula one does Dare not we? want customer dare we, dare we dream <laughs> customer they do not want customer cars they don't want ferrari and mercedes building cars for the rest of the teams right they want every team to build their own car even red bull and toro rosso have completely different chassis hmm. one built in italy one built in in england now i've always thought dare to dream i've always thought the magic that we observed when we watched Can-Am mm -hmm. in the early days, that magic is gone now mm -hmm. from racing. That magic was really unlimited. Here's, here's the parameter. Here's like a box on the ground. Have a car fit into the box on the ground. Here, you can't be wider than this, can't be longer than this, can't be taller than this. Now, have a certain amount of fuel. Right now it's 36 gallons for Formula One. Have a certain amount of fuel in a box size car. Put a tire maximum on there, tire width maximum. Now, that's the rules, along with safety equipment and obviously the, the usual safety stuff. Go, solve it with any engine, solve it with any, with any amount of refueling you wanna do, with any amount of tire changes you wanna do. With that, you get things like the STP turbine cars for mm -hmm. Indy. With that... They killed that creative thinking. With that, you get chaparrels with automatic transmissions and plates that move the wing as you go on to the straightaway. With that, you get both rear engine and front engine cars running together at Indianapolis. Mm -hmm. That wide open, yep. see how you can solve it kind of thing. You want to really throw this, throw this for a loop? Cut back on those 36 gallons. Go to 30 gallons. Have them do something with that. Well, and all I would add to that is, and don't give it all to them at once. Make them come in the pits to get some of it. Well, again, you can you can kind of tweak this any way you want. I want to see creativity again. I don't want to see creativity with both hands tied behind your back, you know, in this kind of, you know, this, this minuscule thing where you can't see it from the stands. I want to be able to see creativity from the stands. Well, I don't know the sanctioning body out there that has that idea more than... <laughs> that, that now, obviously, the... NASCAR has proven me wrong. Yeah. But... <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Wait do you see the uh, ridiculous aerodynamic packages and the control they put on this year's Indy 500. I hope they can keep them on the ground. Uh, I think there's a pretty good chance when, Je when uh, Jeff Gordon leads the pace lap, he could lead the race. Uh, he's going to be in a Z06, he's gonna be in a, a in a Z06 Corvette. Corvette. He may be in a position to go on to win. That's a funny Remarkable. Yeah, well, <laughs> won't be so funny when people are paying lots of monies to watch it. That said, hey, AMFM listeners, we're going to go to break right now. We come back. A special guest for you. In fact, here's a teaser. Angela Savage. Those of you who've been around a while are going to recognize that name. That's right. The daughter of the famed Sweet Savage. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Driver's Talk. Rick Titus, Jay Dalton, and of course, Spencer Crick. If you're watching us on your computer or YouTube or all the different methodologies one can actually watch this program on, you've noticed there's another person at the table, and it ain't a guy. It's um, actually the daughter of a very famous uh, race driver by the name of Swede Savage. Now, Swede Savage was really, in terms of motor racing history, discovered by Dan Gurney. When Dan Gurney picks you out to be his teammate in the Trans Am series back in 1970, 
you got to know you're a pretty talented cat because there's not many people that would have turned down Dan Gurney the opportunity to be that second teammate car. So here's this guy that most of us at that juncture had not heard of, and now he's in the other Barracuda with Dan Gurney. I, m- I might also add, Dan turned over his own ride yeah. to Sweet Savage. At the time, Dan Gurney had to step out of the car, so knowing Dan, mm-hmm. hey. <laughs> yeah. Had to be the best. That's, that's a big commitment. So yes, a number sir. of things. This, this one, Trans Am, is really at its height, the Factories are involved. Everyone's a player. It's great racing, famous names. And here we got this new guy, Sweet Savage, and he's in a Chrysler Plymouth back car. Uh, it, it, the Dan Gurney All American Racers is actually entering in the Trans Am series. Well, he proved to be up to the responsibility, let me tell you. And as quick as those cars could go, he made them go. Then, of course, anytime you see a, a, another California up chart at that time, guess what? Other forms of racing allure them or lure them in. And, of course, Indy was one that was big on Swede's checklist. Now, right after my father's death, Jay, in Trans Am in 1970, Swede came in to do some testing on our 71 cars with the Smoky Unic engines out mm-hmm. at Riverside. And we uh, we spent about three days out there with Swede doing some engine testing. Uh, of course, all three engines blew up. But, you know, you got your highs, you got your lows. Uh, of course, Swede goes on might to... might have been more smoky than Swede. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, it was smoky. Right. It was, no, it wasn't Literally. Swede. Literally. Yeah. Uh, smoky was pretty good at, at letting mistakes get made. He saw the mistake that was being made, but he said nothing about correcting it because mm-hmm. he sold three engines. That said, Swede Savage... Goes to Indianapolis, and gosh darn it, he is quick. I mean, he is quick right out of the box. Everyone's got it. He's got their attention. He makes the show as a rookie. Uh, And it all goes well until it doesn't go very well at all. If you know motor racing from the 70s, the 60s and 70s, it was about as dangerous a line of work as you could possibly be in. I am the son of a a fatality in in motor racing, and next to me, this charming young lady, Angela Savage, is a Swede's daughter, yet unborn at the time of his death at Indianapolis. That's correct. I was there with my mom. She was uh, six months pregnant with me in in the audience, you know, of course, watching the race. This is in 1973. 1973, yes. 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 So we'll be candid. Not only have we seen motor racing become considerably safer, uh, for a long time, you really stayed away from motor racing. You didn't want a part of it uh, for pretty obvious reasons. You know, to be What's honest, it was it was just really, it was a difficult origin to grasp. Yeah. You know, it was, uh, it felt sort of like this badge of, of tragedy that I, I didn't know how to wear. Mm-hmm. You know, so for so long, just in, as a defense mechanism, you know, I really just pushed it way back as far as I could. I didn't know how to be Swede's daughter. I didn't know how to. Um, deal with the tragedy in healthy ways and um, so I kind of I did I went as far away from racing as I possibly could Mm -hmm. until just this last year yeah, now see, that's kind of interesting. There was a young man killed in a Porsche 550 Spider. Uh, an actor had only done two movies uh, and, of course, became very, very famous. Uh, I think more famous in death than when he was alive. His name was... James Dean? James Dean. You're, I hate to say it, but the comparison is your dad's kind of the James Dean of racing. This is a guy that everyone had their eye on, had so much talent, right, was, uh, right. ridiculously good looking, so, very, very uh, young. Uh, illegally good looking, yeah, I say. I mean, it should really just be... It hurts to look at him almost because there's states he probably so wasn't even allowed to go to yeah, yeah it hurts the eyes you gotta wear shades <laughs> good looking Angela, guy I, 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 honest to goodness i think that's what most people remember is his handsomeness yeah, yeah. that's that's the first recollection he he did pretty good in racing but man he was a striking figure out of that car he yeah. really was and he just sort of had this aura about him he was just the coolest of the cool he was cool yep. you know sweet had swagger you know can i ask you something uh, very personal stuff. Please. How did you learn about your dad? Did your mom tell you? Did other people tell you? Did you research it? How did you learn about your dad? Well, it's interesting. I was just talking to Rick about this on the way up here. Um, my very first real recognition was the Fire and Rain documentary about the 1973 race the whole thing Mm -hmm. and I was really young I must have been five or six and I I really nobody really set me up properly for what I was about to see that is extremely heavy for five or six years old and then nobody talked to me about it afterwards either you know too much and I'm sure I didn't ask I mean it's no no real fault to anybody you know but at that moment I closed my doors and I nailed the, the doors shut for 40 years my goodness. Uh, maybe we should explain just for a second 
what happened in 1973. Let's do a little recap, and please join in if you can add any detail that, okay. you, that you've learned. In 73, the first fatality occurred with Art Pollard during qualification. Art Pollard was on Pat Patrick's racing team. He died uh, in, in, a, in practice, if I'm not mistaken. It wasn't even qualifying. So there was an immediate scar on the month of May in, in India in 73. Then the rains came down and they started getting delays and so forth. They eventually, they started the race. They used to race on Mondays on that, in that year. They had not moved it to Sunday. They raced on Monday, May 28th, and immediately right out of the gate, we have Salt Walther. If you remember the Salt Walther oh. crash on the start line, on the opening lap, Gosh. red flagged the, the, the race on the opening lap. Gosh. And we have Salt Walther coming, the car coming apart in the, the uh, fuel going into the crowds and and the the famous uh, visual of feet. salt the walther's feet, feet, feet sticking out the of the feet. front of the car because the front of the car had been taken off it was just up on facebook Ooh. last week it's it's so hard to look at it really is very difficult the salt but he survives it i, I mean survives. i meet, I meet it salt later yeah goes uh -huh. on you you did yeah he goes on to to live a a troubled life but mm -hmm. but uh into his uh, 60s but uh has a uh, uh, terrible uh, scars because of this this oh, mental and off, physical yeah. i'm sure there's yeah, no way to emotional. go through emotionals yep. is actually what i'm getting at there's no i don't think there's any way to survive a crash like that and not have some post-traumatic stress you know i mean that's that's about as stressful as it gets really and that was that was as close as we came to putting an indy car into the crowd yep. to be honest the fuel came through it was pre fuel bladder days and uh there was there was a problem there the the race thing got rained out after it was was started again it got rained out delayed the tuesday the tuesday it went on it was delayed the wednesday the 30th may 30th it finally got underway and it gets underway and angela this is when this is when your family is so affected about 50 57 laps i think it 56 is 56 laps 56 laps yeah. in, into the race first place he was in in the lead and running running for first and battling yeah uh, battling all the way and it was a it was a race between uh, unser Bobby Unser, if I'm not mistaken, your dad, Sweet Savage, and, and others who were really quick at the time, and uh, lost it in turn four, hit the inside wall, and all heck broke loose at that time. It's an ugly crash. This is prolonged. It was a prolonged crash. Prolonged thing, and uh, it, again, it was before fuel bladders. There was a fire, and your dad remarkably survived the fire. If you can imagine, for our, for our listening audience, if you can imagine, this is live on broadcast television. and uh, He was full, uh, fully engulfed. Uh, fully in engulfed flames. and survived that moment. They got to him in time. He later succumbed of, of uh, uh, lung, failure. lung failure because of breathing if in the, the flames. Yeah, you can't use your lungs. There's just no way to survive. There's been, there's been so many different theories about what the actual cause of death was, and uh, my family thinks it's really important that it was the lungs. It was the fire in mm -hmm. the lungs. You know, at the time of his death, they had him on 100% <coughs> oxygen. You know, if you can't breathe, there's there's um, there's not much you can do. Most pe people believe that your dad succumbed at the Indy 573. He did not. He did not. He he was alive for 33 days, um, and all the doctors very um, avidly said, "We don't know how he's alive." Well, he was a strong guy. He's this living on on God's guy. will right now. His body. I mean, it, it, it was it was a miracle that he lived the 33 days that he did. Incredibly, during the accident, there was a secondary accident which involved a crew member, yeah. a fire truck hitting a crew member and right. killing a crew member, also on Pat Patrick's team. Amen. Wow. And it was because the fire track was actually going the wrong way Down towards, towards the, the, the guy that was hit. Upstream, yeah. right. against the traffic right. flow. And this occurred in front of the entire And there's footage. I mean, it's, it's on the uh, Fire and Rain documentary, too. You see mm -hmm. the crash, the fire, the screams, and then you see him get hit and just ragdoll down the road and you know it was it was the apocalypse on to the make track. this oh, the, this is the darkest days of indy absolutely the darkest days but to compound the mystery of this race in 73 
It was won by Gordon Jontcock. Yes. Who was on the Pat Patrick racing team. He went ahead so and won it for, for th- my dad. I, I, um, I hope to get to thank him one day in person, but um, I'm sure he knows that. I, uh, two drivers, one crewman, and the victory of the race. Right. This is unbelievable. Unbelievable. And uh, he ended up just grabbing a burger. He didn't go to any of the celebration parties. John, John Cock, that is. He was at the hospital. Went straight to the hospital yeah, to see your dad. Yeah, a hamburger instead of celebrating, you know. So it, 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 was, it was wild. It was the context wild. Is, is just unbelievable. It's a fascinating read. If you do nothing more, Google 1973 Indy 500. If you never get to see the movie Fire and Rain. Fire and Rain is a documentary that was Because the race was shortened because of rain. It was, too. Yes. Yeah, it was made a while called. ago, but um, also Wikipedia has um, a lot of really good sweet savage information. And then the story, actually, at the end of Wikipedia, um, it doesn't end there. So we come back from break. We're going to talk about the fact that you are now going to Indianapolis. AMFM listeners will be right back. And welcome back to Driver's Talk. Rick Titus, Jay Dalton, of course, Spencer Crick, and special guest, Angela Savage, daughter of Swede Savage. Uh, kind of the James Dean of motor racing, if you will. This this attractive, healthy, virile, fit young race driver. Everyone was courting him. This was a guy that was going to be a legend in this business. Actually turned out to be a legend in this business and didn't need to survive the length of his potential career because he would have been very famous and very successful in just about any car he drove. He proved that very early on. We've kind of in, we had to kind of cover the dark period, uh, having lost uh, a parent like uh, Angela in motor racing. Sometimes you have to just talk about it. But there are positives now in Angela's life that come as a result of you facing that realizing yes, what a great guy your dad was not just as a race driver but as a human being and how popular he was people love the cat it was kind of one of those cats you met him and they still you, do I you mean, know you can't help but like the guy a right. lot and um, so just just remind our our uh, our listeners here you never met your father i just missed him and that's actually been some of the salt in the womb everybody and their mother got to know my dad except for me you were just about to be born I in 1973 him. i was born three months after he died uh-huh. i know he was hanging on for me and he couldn't quite make it till i was here but um we have our own special connection if you will okay so you you struggled with this for years obviously this was a the the darkest part of your life yeah it was and a badge of terror i did not know how to wear yes so first of all briefly how did you work your way out of that well when my son chance savage jackson was born um it was time for me to make a lot of changes in my life just so i could have a healthier spirit and be more of a happy person you know i always have i've suffered with depression you know from from lots of things so uh last year um on facebook you know, uh, Paul Powell, he, he figured out who I was, you know, and I'm just, I'm a stay at home mom. Mm-hmm. So that's what I kind of what I do for fun. And then my, um, Paul figured out who I was and started asking me if I'd ever go back, if I'd ever consider going back to Indy. And at first it was a no way sort of thing. Why would I want to go there? But, and, um, then it, he gathered a lot of people together who put funds together and a lot of encouragement and they got me there last year. And I tell you what, it was like a uh, light getting turned on inside of me. I mean, I'm a different person. It changed me forever. The magic electricity that's around there, uh, I don't know, charged me back up. Well, the first thing is you couldn't walk through the pit lane at, at Indianapolis without somebody saying your dad's name, right? I mean, everybody still knows your yes. dad's name. Yeah. Well, t- um, I was a little more in... Uh, it was a little under the radar last year. You know, I um, I did have a big party with, and everyone was invited. It was kind of set up like a talk show with slides and it was it was really great. But besides that, um, I stayed a little bit on the down low because I didn't know what my reactions were going to be. I didn't know if sure. I was going to end up in a ball, you know, crying. Sure. So I, I, um, I just kind of kept quiet you know and, and didn't make a big scene but this year is going to be a lot different because um through this past year uh the people that loved my dad you know they have all this love left and, and they want to give it to me and it's the most humbling amazing thing that has ever happened and it's changed my life it's absolutely <laughs> changed my life and now i'm strong enough and i'm ready to be swede's daughter you know uh 
the way Sweet's daughter should be, you know, and make him proud. Significantly, you went back on year 41. This is year 42 of your dad's crash and passing. Mm -hmm. 42 is a special number for your family, isn't it? It is. It was um, my dad's number. That was his number. He had a cat named 42, and it's just... uh, that, that, that number's always been associated with my dad. And mm-hmm. That's why I took the 40 on the Pat Patrick STP car, because it was the closest to the 42, <laughs> you know? So he really is, uh, 42 was the number he, he associated himself with. That big 42 on the side of the uh, Barracudas, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, they, they were huge. The Dan the Gurney uh, yeah. is uh, unmistakable. Even even the script of the And now she has her own clothing line. Yes. Well, what's oh, this clothing line oh, now? This is uh, Savage 42 Inc. Uh, this is my very first T-shirt. 42. Come on, can I show you? Oh. Show the back. A little bit. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it has a, a profile of your dad on yeah, the back. Yes. Yeah, this is the very Beautiful. first one. And I'm going to do a merchandising line. I'm planning on hats and jackets and mini helmets and, you know, all, all kinds of fun stuff. See what stuff. happens. Just getting started. See what happens. Yeah. That's kind of cool. Yeah. It's, it's so the, she it's, said last year she went back and didn't want to make a big scene. This year you're planning to make a pretty oh, big scene. I'm making scene. a scene. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the so. sad part is over. The yeah. scary part is over. You know, uh, uh. it feels like I'm getting to, to some of the gravy, the good part, you know, and... And so uh, it doesn't hurt. It's it's where I'm supposed to be. It feels I'm 40 years late to the party. I do feel that way a little bit, but I'm glad to be here. Late is better than never, right? And um, I really want to get out on the circuits and be at the SVRAs and the VARAs mm. and just um, n- know that group and, and, and be amongst my people. Mm. That I finally found, you know, you my long lost racing family. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, this is the history of American motorsport. Your yep. dad's name is part of it. Your dad's name, my host here, <laughs> Ricky Titus, is uh, dad is part of it. Uh, this is a uh, a very unique uh, unique club uh, to be part of uh, in the history books, and and both of their names are very very much in the history books. But uh, what a pleasure to meet you, Angela. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it, it's, uh, she uh, uh, comes here local. She's a local in town yep. uh, uh, out in uh, Boulder, Boulder City. City. Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. So uh, she's around quite a bit. You have a Facebook. I mean, I see you on Facebook all the time. Yeah, yeah. you can find me on Facebook. I'm, I'm happy to friend anybody that was a fan or, or just wants to be a friend. You know, I'm... I'm, I'm I'm extending my family, and I, I'll let it be as big as it needs to be. We're recording this just a couple of days before Indianapolis. Good luck at Indy Thanks. this weekend. I leave tonight on the red eye. Yeah. Oh, boy. Yeah. Oh, here. boy. Just, here we go. I am on so excited. <laughs> Should be fun. Should be fun. Well, that yeah. said, yeah. Uh, yes. good stuff. Hey, we got a couple of things we're going to need to move on to as well. Going to be, it was a very safe Indy qualifying because the decisions made to uh, slow the cars down a bit. They were going in the 33 club, 233. Uh, and, of course, uh, they backed them down to 226. Got the pole for Scott Dixon, Ganassi on the pole. And then two Penske entries uh, next to that. So, Pazanow and, of course, uh, Will Power. This uh, new aero body kit uh, came into question, didn't it, Rick? It did, because it worked real good going one way, but it did not work real good going the other way. <laughs> I bet it worked worked real good uh, uh, with the <clears throat> idea of keeping the cars on the ground at very high speed. But once you get those turned around, it's but curtains, all three isn't it? cars that crashed, the three Chevy-powered cars that had a very elaborate aerodynamic package for the 500, uh, went into snap oversteers. And so one can't wonder if that system somehow, all, all that package, failed them somehow. Because as they would get into turn one, they would be fine, and then boom, go into a snap oversteer. That would put them into the fence or the wall, as Eddie Cheever reminded us repeatedly, uh, hit the wall. And by going backwards, those wings that were pushing them down were now lifting them up. Three cars went flying, and Castro Nevis probably is going to hear from the FAA because he flew well over the standard heights. Uh, you know, those it, pictures that were caught of the entire underbody of his car. Oh yeah. I, I'm thinking, this has disaster written all yep, over it. He had very soft landings, fortunately. Ed Carpenter probably had the most violent of the three. That was uh, hard to watch. That, that, was, that was a hard was hit. really hard to watch. Yeah, yeah. but that said, and so thank God he's okay. the officials decided to uh, slow the cars down. Them. Honda was not happy about that because they felt their cars had not proven to be a problem. Their aerodynamic package being different, quite a bit different actually, and of course uh, made the cars easier to identify. Mm-hmm. They still have that, but they they lowered the boost to race reg and they went to a 
different aero package and required that whatever you qualified with aero package wise you had to race with you know uh, uh again dialed back for safety they mm-hmm. know that this is a, a critical moment here mm-hmm. they can get this wrong in a big way mm-hmm. and have another very dark day at indianapolis they're not going to have that we're not having that but because we had Angela on the show today, I made a quick list of a couple of things, a couple of improvements. I wonder if you can you can add to this, Rick. Obviously, fuel cells fuel. F- since the 70s. Right. Fu- internal fuel bladders was probably the single biggest thing that saved lives in this uh, right. in it this uh, area. But of course, now we keep pounds of fuel then. 70 pounds of, of uh, uh, methanol uh, at yeah, the time. Yeah, it's a rocket. You know, can explode for sure. You don't see wheels coming off of cars anymore during crashes. They're tethered wheels. They usually sure. stay on. They usually stay on. That, that is also something that's happened. Um, the inside walls and safer barriers. Inside walls have been moved back. That inside wall that your dad hit at Indy isn't there anymore. It's moved way back. Safer barriers on the front uh, uh, edge of those walls to... Uh, uh, help with the collision driver safety cells the way the cars are made now the way they're constructed to keep everything together Hans devices on on the helmets safety fencers that are higher and and have bigger cables running through them to keep the cars uh, uh, out of the grandstands against all odds and parts from the cars yeah. and parts from the cars right. as well yeah. better helmets better suits the fire suits um, yeah. did it made a huge improvement after, after that year in fact um, I think uh, I think it was just the next year they had better fire suits too. Let me ask you, my dad. You still have your dad's fire suit. Did it have epaulets on the on the shoulders? Did it have a way to extract him? Do you recall? I don't believe those suits. Seventy three. No. Not back uh-uh, then. No. I don't think back. Then. Back then there no. was nothing on the shoulders. No. Nowadays there are handles in effect on the top of the suit so that uh-huh. you can handle. Well, see, I mean, I've seen pictures of him fully engulfed in fire, but he's still strapped into what's left of the car. Right. I don't see how anybody could have, it was over at that point. Nobody, I don't know if anyone could have extracted him. He still was uh, strapped into the fire. Right, dangerous. Yeah. Now, Ricky, you've just recently got some updated gear. You're telling me now that there are special handles for the helmet. Well, you can wear a thing called a helmet uh, lift and it's a, it, you put it on over the top of your balaclava. This thing lays kind of on your shoulders. You put your helmet on and that way if they have to remove the helmet carefully, they can just pull up on this thing and it will pull the helmet off straight, Come straight up yeah. and even and yeah so yeah there have been huge breakthroughs and gigantic and, and it's a never there's ending there's even impact regions on these cars for crush both in the nose and on the tail um, continuators they have a term for it goes on the back of the transaxle so if they back into the fence this thing eats a lot of energy and I don't know if you know but uh, Gail Truist just sent me they're actually wearing a G meter in their ears so um they, they, so they know before they even get to them what kind of G's the body took. The never-ending quest oh. for safety. Yeah. Listen, we got to go to break. Hey, go to our Facebook page, click like us, answer the true or false question, and we'll send you Mickey Thompson's fast life and tragic death of a racing legend. It just seemed appropriate this week. We wish you open roads and safe motoring. Enjoy the 500. God bless.